Good morning, traders, and welcome to the Bookmap Pro Trader, Pro Trader webinar series here. Uh, we do this uh, once a quarter, uh, typically. Uh, yesterday, we had uh, Joseph, uh, J Trader. Um, I have the link for you uh, for that, uh, for that recording, if you like, and, I'll, and as well uh, uh, for today's webinar, uh, Brent Kachuba from Spot Gamma uh, for both futures and stocks here. Uh, and he's going to be looking at... Um, well, they offer a, a, a subscription service, but uh, uh, for options. But uh, we're going to take a look at some examples of, uh, you know, understanding options and applying that to order flow uh, in Bookmap. Uh, so, uh, as you guys know, a lot of the uh, uh, people that are attending um, are using this subscription service already, and and just love it. I mean, it, it's just been uncanny how good these levels have been. Uh, Brent is just an expert here uh, in options. Uh, here's his background or biography right here. Uh, he's been in equities and derivatives for almost 20 years. Uh, all this institutional background uh, worked for B of A, Credit, Credit Suisse, uh, as an equities broker and as an equities broker uh, and algorithmic sales and trading. Um, yeah, then uh, following that, he's in institutional sales for Wolverine, uh, representing their electronic derivatives trading platform. Uh, and then currently Brent uh, trades some proprietary strategies and runs spotgamma.com, uh, which he publishes very metric, various metrics on options data. Uh, and he'll go over all of that. Uh, I have uh, his contact information here. I'll be putting this into the, um, the chat. Uh, this is kind of important uh, actually, because uh, they're just offering a new service, like I was mentioning, uh, that you guys have uh, access to. So let me show you this here before I turn it over to Brent. Okay, this is on the Bookmap Marketplace here. Okay, so you can go to Bookmap Marketplace. Don't worry, I'll put this link in here. Uh, and uh, this is where you can get it, all right? So uh, you want options uh, levels it, that, that Brent will show you what you're getting here. This is where to find it, all right? So uh, it's 20 from $29 or, uh, you know, you can click on the levels here and you'll see it $29 here. Or you want the pro version, which is $99. All right, so uh, if you guys are interested in this, this is where you can find it. Uh, all right, well, uh, let's turn it over to Brent and let's uh, listen in. Thanks, Bruce. Hopefully you guys can all hear me here. I'm gonna hopefully show my screen here. I'm trying to get to make sure I get the right one. All right, there we go. You see that all right, Bruce? Yeah, it looks great. All right, sweet. Thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, so we're going to cover kind of the basics around options gamma, why it's important. I'm going to focus on the S&P 500 here, uh, but the levels also work great for the NASDAQ as well as the Russell. So I'm going to just give a brief overview of the gamma concept and why we think options has such a major impact on trading levels in the S&P 500 as well as individual stocks. And then we can actually look at some individual stocks as well. So what you see here is our our book map screen and on the left side here in the cloud notes are our key options levels for today and what these options levels represent are major support and resistance areas and the reason that we believe they are major support and resistance areas is because these are levels for which we detect options market makers have large heavy large hedging activity to do right so what that means is that if you think about an options market maker, they have giant positions in, in spiders and SPX and individual equities as well, right? This this all applies kind of the same way. And they are not, their deal is, is to not take directional risk, right? The way that options market makers make money is through collecting bid-ass spread on options and, and doing that on a lot of transactions. So they need to directionally hedge their risk. And they do that in the S&P 500 and in spiders with ES futures. And if you think about the uniqueness of an options market maker, as opposed to say a large hedge fund, is that options market makers have essentially unlimited firepower, right? Because what they're constantly doing is trading in and trading out of a position or around large options levels all day. And so if you think about a fund, if a fund had, let's say $50 million worth of futures to buy, they would come in, they would buy or sell their futures and they would be done for the day, right? So they may be able to make maybe make this last move happen, right? But then they would be out of firepower, right? They, they would have their, their trade done for the day and they may be done. But an options market maker is going to be there all day long hedging their position, right? When they're hedging, they are reducing their risk. And so they can then 
um, reload, so to speak, when the market moves a certain amount or when, the, or, or when new options positions come in. So it's that hedging activity that really that, that really creates the, the support and resistance levels that we find in the market. So I wanted to touch very quickly on today's levels, um, just to give you all some context into what we are looking at. So there's essentially two large areas in the S&P rate right now that we're, that we're watching. And the first one is, and I have to zoom way out for this, is the 3900 strike. And this is an SPX term, so you have to do a slight adjustment to your futures level. But the two big levels are 3900 and 3800. And so why are those levels so important? Uh, well, I'd like to show you a quick chart of the options position for today. So this is all this is all subscriber data available on spotgamma.com. And, and generally I show a presentation, but what I thought was more interesting today is just to go through a live, you know, sort of look at the trading uh, metrics that the options provide today to show you how you may have been able to predict some of this volatility. So what we're looking at here are the major options levels in the S&P 500. So if you think about this chart, this is the, the, the bars going vertical are a measure of how much call open interest there is, right? And this is a gamma weighted interest. But think about this as the number of calls at a certain strike and the number of puts at a certain strike. So you can see at 3,900 and 3,800, there is very large options positions. And this tells us that these are two very big magnets or hedging zones that dealers uh, and market makers that their options flows are going to be tied to, right? So if we flip back to the book map chart, you can see that, look, here's the very large 3,900, which wasn't in play yet today, but at 3,800, there's a whole bunch of liquidity that seems to line up right in that area, right? And this is something that we see all the time in terms of there being dark red pockets of liquidity at these major uh, support and resistance levels. So if you flip back to this other, to, to the chart we were just looking at, you can also see that in between here, there are there's another big level at 38.50. And what this is all kind of breaking down into is that we can map out how dealers are going to react, right, based on these these open interest levels. And there's one or two points which I want to talk about at which we can predict that there will be a large shift in flows. And this is the concept that many of you may be familiar with around what's called positive gamma or negative gamma. And essentially what that boils down to is volatility. So last week, if you guys remember what the market looked like last week, this is a this is a little bit of a backdated chart to give a little more context. But if you look around what happened last week, we had very low levels of volatility in the market, right? We sort of just pinned this 3,900 level, as you can see on my screen, for most of the week. Volatility, the amount that the market moved up and down, was very low, and prices mean reverted. What I mean by that is 3,900 was this sort of magnet day in and day out, and the market never broke out of a very tight range. And so what's interesting about that is there was a lot of call positions last week in the market, and all of those calls or 50% of those call positions, if you measure that on a stock basis, expired on this past Friday, which was the 19th. And so what you have is with call positions, you have large market maker or dealer hedging tied into a very tight and consolidated area. So the big open interest area that expired last week was in the 3,900 to 3,950 area. So we had huge levels of open interest in this zone up here that all expired on Friday. And I bring that up because we had very low levels of volatility on last week, right into Friday, because there's a lot of hedging activity tied into this zone right here. And then what happened is on Friday, all of that open interest expires. And so that tells us that all of that dealer hedging activity that was pinning the market in here is suddenly gone. And that pinning activity is, is removed, right? The, the hedging activity tied to all this open interest is removed. So if you then look at and zoom in a little bit now, this was on Friday, right? The 3,900 pin, and then suddenly all that open interest expires right here, it's gone. And what happens? Now the market can move and be more volatile. And we talked about this in our subscriber notes, but if you just sort of think about, again, I talked about how options market makers have unlimited flow, the impact or the amount of volume that they could be right in the market, in the ES futures market is much larger than really any other entity that I could name because they are in there day in and day out and they are constantly needing to hedge and readjust. And so these flows are persistent all day long, every single day. And so that is also you know, why their impact can be so large. So again, 
because all that open interest expires, and this goes for single stocks as well, now that opened the door for volatility. And we talk about volatility, we're just saying how much the market can move up or down. People tend to express you know, volatility as being a negative thing, meaning that, you know, oh, the market's volatile, meaning the market's going to tank, right? But volatility is just movement. And so if you're a futures trader, you want to know when are markets likely to be volatile because of dealer hedging flows support that, or when is it going to be very tight and consolidated moves? And so we have a few metrics we can measure and, and show you how you can measure that. But essentially, what the two components of what we're trying to talk about is volatility, how much movement there's going to be in the day, right? And we just gave an example of of you know the situation which may increase or decrease volatility so we have volatility and then we have large open interest levels that support that that create support and resistance and that you can see today uh, again as these three large bars of open interest and if you look on the book map charts you know they the market is really respecting these big zones right so let's talk about what gamma hedging is quickly just to give you guys an idea of what takes place so we measure when we measure an option market maker's position, we pretend or we assume that essentially all open interest in the S&P 500, which is the SPX and the SPY, we pretend that is our position, right? Spot Gamma says, okay, we are a market maker and our position is essentially all available open interest in the S&P 500. How would we hedge that, right? What flows do we, where would we need to hedge and how do we need to hedge? And what we find is that there's this concept of negative gamma and positive gamma and some of you may have heard this as the gex um, and a lot of times on social media and things like that you'll hear this idea of zero gamma and when, when does gamma flip and the like so why does that matter well when there's a lot of call positions in the market we detect that dealers are in what's called a positive gamma position so what does that really mean well positive gamma speaks to how a market maker will hedge when a dealer has a positive gamma position it means that they are trading mean revertive flows. It means that their hedging style is going to be as the market goes up, they're going to sell futures. And as the market goes down, they're going to buy futures. So if you can think about what that would mean, again, if we're looking at sort of the charts of last week, why did we pin the 3,900 level all week, right? It's because as the market went up, we had very large positive gamma positions. So as the market goes up, dealers short futures. As the market comes down, they start to buy futures back. And you can see this range, right? You can see this, it's like ping pong around a very tight consolidated area. Now there's a level at which dealers would shift their hedging activity from what's called a positive gamma position to a negative gamma position. A negative gamma position means that dealers are going to be trading in the same direction as the market. So if the market goes down, they're going to start shorting futures. And if the market goes up, they're going to start buying futures. And we generally detect what this division uh, division line is, what the dividing line is, for that gamma flip, is where the market shifts from having more call options or a more concentrated call position on a gamma measurement basis to a, a put position. So just think about it from a high level. When we have a lot of calls, dealers have a positive gamma position. And when we have a lot of puts, dealers have a negative gamma position. Said another way, when we have a lot of calls, there's low volatility in the market. And when we have a lot of puts, there's high volatility in the market. So you can see what happens here, right, at this gamma flip level. This is the area which dealers would switch or transition from a positive gamma position to a negative. And this is a number that changes every single day. And we put this out in, in the uh, on the subscription products that, that Bruce talked about. But basically what you see is when we hit this flip level, right, it's a support and resistance line. But it is also telling you where dealers are going to structurally change how they're trading. And this is important because if you think about your trading setup, right, how, how much movement are you anticipating when you go to scalp your futures or swing trade your futures, right? Well, it changes based on what the other dealer positions are. So in a positive game position, you want to you want to play tighter swings, right? Mean reversion flow. And then when we break these flip lines, you suddenly want to say, okay, I'm not going to try to scalp, say, five or 10 handles, right? I'm going to look for big, large swings between these big gamma levels. And so you can see that around this flip level, all of a sudden sort of the door opens and we just drop like a rock into the next big area or the big level. So what we have is the situation now where markets at the moment are in a negative gamma position. And that's because there are more puts and there's more put gamma around where current prices are trading. So if I flip back to this chart that we had talked about kind of at the open, you can see that this area where my mouse is is roughly where the market is trading. So up in the 3900, there's a whole bunch of calls, right? You can see that there's 
more of a concentrated call position up here. And then as we get down into 3,800, the net put open interest starts to change, right? It starts to increase. And that's telling us again, that around this area that dealers are gonna be shorting as the market goes down and buying as it goes up. And that's gonna, what we would say is expand volatility. So if we expand on this volatility concept a little bit more, what we do every day is we measure how big what we call total gamma is in the market. What we do is, in, in another in other words, how much hedging flow do market makers have in the market? And so what's interesting about this, and many of you are familiar with this chart, that the larger or more positive gamma that we measure in the market, right, the more of a, of a positive mean reverting hedging flows that dealer have, this is the one day move right on the on the y-axis, and this is how much gamma there is. So two, four, you know, uh, four obviously tells there's more positive gamma, and then below zero, this is the negative gamma market. So what we're getting at here is that volatility is a function of how much gamma or how much positive hedging flows are in the market. So you can see that the mean return, right, the one day return in markets is much tighter. There's a much lower range in markets when we have a lot of positive gamma. And then when we flip, right, today we just flipped, is when you get really large returns, right? You get volatility. And this is movement up and down in markets, right? You see that the volatility expands when we break down, you know, through this zero barrier, so to speak. And so each day, based on open interest and how much is traded, we update this gamma level. But the key is to know that, again, this is letting us know how much vol uh, how much volatility, how large are the swings in the market, and then we can put that in context of sort of what the big big trading levels are. So we're expecting for today, you know, the fact that we did break down through this volatility trigger area that we would get this big sell-off, this big volatile move, and this is a 50-handle drop, and then we hit this big 3,800 line. And at 3,800, there's a lot of open interest, and so we expect there to be intraday shifts in options volumes, right? People are going to not just sit there with their put options, they're gonna close them and roll them, and that can create um, key you know, movements in intraday hedging that needs to take place. So you know, these are active trading levels. We expect volatility in large, directional swings which is kind of what we've seen uh, here so far today so hopefully that kind of gives the basis around you know what it is we look for what it is that we're producing you know these big uh key open interest levels that change every single day and then this concept of negative and positive gamma which is really what is depicting how much volatility to expect so if you can take those two concepts and over overlay them on whatever your strategy may be uh, hopefully you can see sort of what the power is right if, if you if you're a swing trader and you trade off the vwap you know when the vwap coincides with a large option um open interest area that can be a very powerful signal right and there and there's all sorts of different strategies we know uh that people like to focus on um for their own unique strategies and we think this really can be overlaid on any of those the other thing to note is that with the new systems that bruce and the company have opened in terms of iceberg trackers and the like you can see that there's a lot of correlation between icebergs and hidden liquidity in these options levels. And um, we think that makes a lot of sense because you know options market makers have areas where they know they need to hedge and where they need to be extra active. And so those zones will show up. I had a computing problem this morning, so I apologize. I don't have that those iceberg traders load up. Around 10.50, actually, my computer uh, decided to call quit. So I apologize for that. So those are the those are the brief concepts, uh, two concepts which I wanted to talk about and touch on today. I don't know if anyone wants to ask any questions about this before I move to sort of single stock conversations. I know I went through this kind of fast. It's a volatile day, and I know many of you are very busy. So I could take a few questions on this, and then we could talk about uh, some single stock trading um, and, and concepts if if you'd like. Uh, yeah, uh, Doug is asking here um, immediately uh, uh, as the webinar started. Um, uh, if you could talk about the uh, the QQQs uh, and the relationship with to the NQ uh, futures. Sure. So there's there's an interesting thing in in Nasdaq, and what matters to anything that we talk about is open interest levels, right? If there's not a big open interest amount of open interest, if there's not a large options position, then then our signals aren't that strong, right? Because low option open interest means not much dealer hedging flow. So the S and P is a massive uh, options complex, meaning there are tons, there's tons of open interest between the SPX index and the spiders. And so we think our signals are really strong there. What's interesting about the NASDAQ is that the NDX options 
don't have all that much open interest, but QQQ has a lot. And so if we kind of flip this page here and go to the NASDAQ, um, many of you that follow our, our data knows uh, know that there are very, um, that the levels in the SPX can be much more concentrated, meaning that there's, that levels are more evenly spaced out, right? Whereas in NASDAQ, the picture is a little different. And what I mean by that is you can see this chart and how scattered the levels are over this, you know, kind of large price band um, versus when you look at the S&P 500, you know, you can see how concentrated and how, you know, uh, well formed, so to speak, the open interest levels are, the gamma weighted open interest levels are in the SPX. And so what I'm getting at is the QQQ actually has a very large and consistent open interest picture. And you can see that here. And so what are really good levels in the NASDAQ are based off of our very large, important levels in the NASDAQ. I mean, there are clearly some of those, right? They're scattered around. But we think that the QQQ really is a big driver for the hedging flows in NASDAQ. And so because these are both linked, you know, we, they're, they're hedged really together um, in a market maker's book, the QQQ open interest, which is huge at 30, uh, 320 and 3810, and this is a 3815 as well, those are those hedging impacts are going to be felt in the NASDAQ. So what we do is we put out what's called combo levels, and the combo levels take the Qs in the NASDAQ and they blend them together and they back out with the, uh, the NASDAQ futures prices. And we do the same thing for the S&P 500. And so that is why, or that's how we look at these products. Now the, um, so so you could look at it as the Qs are kind of wagging the NASDAQ dog in a way is, is how I look at it. Um, and the same, we also offer levels for the IWM and Russell and it's kind of the similar thing. The IWM, IWMs have a very big options complex and Russell tends to be a little bit more scattered. So hopefully that that answers Bruce, uh, excuse me, Doug's question um, and, and uh, explains a little bit about the NASDAQ there. No, that that was that was great. I mean, it's just just excellent. Um, I, it's just stuff. This stuff is just so fascinating. Uh, let's see, that lots of questions coming in here. So, um, uh, yeah, Majid, I'll just, I'll, again, I'm gonna get into the single stock stuff after. I just didn't want to move away from index, you know, questions while we we're on the topic. So, okay. Um, so do you do you mind uh, firing away here with uh, these going through these questions now, or do you want to? Um, yeah, the, yeah. Let's take some of them now, and then um, it'll be tougher because it'll be easier. That the uh, the stock stuff works slightly differently, so I'd rather touch on this and then touch on the. Uh... Okay, uh, Majid, it looks like the um, uh, the that offering for the levels is um, uh, Brent. Maybe you want to talk about that. The twenty nine dollar sure. versus the ninety nine dollar. Yeah. So the twenty nine dollar access gives you just these levels every day. So there's a file link that you'll get that gives you the daily levels every day. You don't get our, um, with with the pro level, you get daily commentary and access to our website, which offers all the charts that we showed you here. If you get the $29 level, you're just getting the link to our book map feed. So you'll know what our support and resistance lines is, but you lose sort of our analysis and our commentary and, and the, some of those charts that I was showing. So that's and what, the difference. What instruments does it work for? So the $99 level gives you access to NASDAQ, uh, Russell, and ES futures levels. And then also you get access to what's called our equity hub, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the equity hub allows you to view the levels for uh, about 4,000 different stocks and ETFs. So I know a lot of people are trading gold and silver, and, and you can see those ETFs in here. We don't yet model commodity futures. Okay. Uh, and... Um, uh, Let's see. I think that that answers that question there. Yep. So, uh, so Matthew says something here about the VIX. The VIX is something that we're working on modeling um, as a VIX complex. So we want to look at sort of VXX and VIX futures and the whole kind of shebang. Um, but you can see the VIX um, open interest here in our equity hub, um, and we could talk about that in a minute. And and the VIX is a the VIX is a tricky a trickier beast to model, so to speak, uh, because of some of these crosswind flows between the VIX futures and, and the and the VIX curve and the like. So uh, we're working on a model for there. Oh, what about the treasuries for futures? Uh, we do not model yet treasury futures. Okay. Uh, let's see. I, I don't know. You have access to the questions here. I don't know if maybe you're a little yeah, quicker, yes. quicker oh, than I am. Um, I'm messing with someone's priority there. Um, so metals we answer, the NASDAQ levels. Uh, so we can 
take a look at the, I don't know if I have the cloud notes measured in for NASDAQ. I will bring those up in a second. Um, so one of the things uh, we can show you is that we also have this little portal pop up. So here I can show you guys what the NASDAQ levels are. Um, so I believe it's Jim C asked about the NASDAQ levels. So these are the big NASDAQ levels for today. I'm hesitant to add, I'm not sure what's going on my computer. So I'm scared if I add in another data feed that something's going to go bad. <laughs> so those are, these are the NASDAQ levels, which also show up in the, uh, in the cloud notes there. Um, so similar questions. Yeah. A bunch about the, the commodities and stuff. So we're looking at launching the commodities, uh, probably more towards Q2. Uh, what I can tell you is that the SLV and GLD have a ton of options, those ETFs. And I think that there is a tail wagging the dog scenario with, with some of those as well, that these ETFs get so big and the options trading on them get so big that I think they can really impact the way that, uh, precious metals move. Um, and I would also state that if you're interested in playing with our equity hub tool, before I get too much into that, if you go to this site, which is, uh, spotgamma.com slash gold silver slash hub. So if you go to this site, we open this up for public view. This is all of the silver and gold mining stocks. So for those of you that are into commodities and looking at some of these gold and silver names, or if you just want to try the equity hub before you, you know, buy, so to speak. Uh, first, I would note that all all products have a five day uh, trial, but if you come into here, uh, gold dash silver dash hub, you can view, you know, today's open interest for the equities, which we'll talk about momentarily. Uh, a lot of commodities questions, which is kind of interesting. Um, so David asked a question about trading on the combo levels. So there's there, good point, David. So there's, there's two points. There's, there's two, uh, there's labels here in front of our levels. L3, L1, L2. So those are the those are the rank of biggest levels to smallest levels. So L2 tells you that 3,900 is the second biggest level in terms of the options gamma concentrated at that at that strike, and then L4 would be the the smallest. So we we only include levels that are over a certain amount of gamma. What a combo level is? A combo level is the is when we take in this case spiders and SPX and combine them. Um, so really, if you think about a combo level, it's it's in, it's combining spiders and SPX and QQQ and NDX, and that's because SPY in particular and QQQ those could get so large, right, that they actually are bigger than the index product itself. And so the combo strike really seeks to to show you where that spider open interest is uh, and how that would inf uh, uh, affect the S&P. And so they are support and resistance lines just like anything else. And so what's interesting, if you look at the S&P today, the biggest combo area, right, the most, the largest gamma area for the S&P 500 is all the way up in the 3950 area. So the fact that we've now kind of broken way below that shows you that the dealer influence right here around this 3850 line is very light, right? We haven't yet seen dealer hedging uh, start selling, right? They're, they're in kind of a no man's land in this 3850 to 3900. And I'll explain why I think that. And it's below really 3,800, that big put open interest kicks in. That's what this put wall is telling you and where dealer selling or dealer shorting would really kick off. So let's talk about what the call wall is and put wall is quickly. The call wall tells us where the most call positions are in gamma terms. And the put wall is where the most put options are in gamma terms, most net put options. And we measure everything on gamma terms because gamma provides a weighting, a hedging based weighting system. We don't just talk about open interest in general because you can have massive open interest at say the 500 strike in SPX or the 10,000 strike in SPX, right? Those are completely irrelevant for hedging purposes on any given basis. But when you weight gamma, gamma is telling you what the what essentially the hedging sensitivity is of an option. So the most sensitive options are where the highest gamma positions are. So up around here where we have the positive gamma mean reverting flows are over 3,900. And you can see how concentrated all these big gamma levels are, right? And then under 3,900, the levels space out. There's much less open interest under 3,900. And it's under 3,800 where the put interest really shifts to being put heavy. And put heavy means dealers are going to be shorting more and more and more. So if you think about what put options mean, right? If if investors are long a lot of put options, 
our options market makers are short a lot of put options. And so they would need to short futures as a hedge, right? Because if the market goes down and you're short puts, you're getting hurt. So the way that you hedge that obviously was selling futures. And so if we really break down into this area, this is where we like to say that put options become activated, right? This is where dealers start to go, uh-oh, like we're we're starting to get short delta here. Like we're starting to get short the market. We're exposed if we're short the market. So we really need to start selling futures. And that's why we can really get an outsized move on the way down. We, we kind of put in our note this morning that if the market only moved down to 3,800 and bounced there, it's more, this is just kind of a consolidation, right? They don't have a lot of flow to necessarily trade, but it's under 3,800 where we go from like, okay, markets are just consolidating to, you know, look for a very big directional short play. So let's talk about the zero gamma idea quickly. If, if in, in a positive gamma market, you know, dealers have a lot of mean reverting flow to hedge and in a negative gamma market, dealers have, you know, directional flow to hedge, meaning they're going to short as the market goes down and buys futures go up. Zero gamma is telling us in another way you could look at zero gamma is they don't, dealers don't, or market makers don't have much hedging to do at all, right? This is where dealers are essentially out of the market in at zero gamma. So they don't have much flow to trade. Now we include the zero gamma line on our charts because it's been interesting over the years. We found it as a major support and resistance line. And we think that's because a lot of people now watch these levels and say, oh, okay, market's hitting zero gamma, you know, like kind of like a 200 day moving average, right? It's just kind of a line on a chart that people respect. It's below here, right? It's below this level that dealers will start having some flows to short, but not, you know, not material. But as we get to where big puts are concentrated, then that's where you know that dealers will have, okay, serious shorts to 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 uh, to hedge, and that's where flows could really shift and, and start to sell off. So hopefully that gives some context around what all these different levels mean. Again, at the end of the day, you can consider them support and resistance levels. And then when you look at the zero gamma or what we call our vol trigger, which is our proprietary sort of zero gamma area, that's where you can say, okay, that zero gamma line is giving us an indication of whether market makers are going to be sort of suppressing volatility with positive gamma or below there going to be expanding you know volatility and and, uh, and creating larger swings um kendall says looking at your trading view charts as soon as you're planning your day with only the put wall call wall on vol trigger so on you know one of my personal pet peeves about people in this industry and i try very hard to like, avoid this is that you know, providing a level every three or four points, right? I, I see a lot of times where people will list a key support and resistance levels every five points in the markets. And I've, I get very frustrated with that. Our levels are spaced out simply at where both big open interest levels are. Um, and they can sort of be concentrated in some ways. But if you notice, you know, they're sort of spaced out quite largely here. And if you look at what we're looking at here, this is a 300 handle range right so there are a bunch of levels listed on this chart but that is spread drastically over a really giant area of trading and so today the put wall you know doesn't seem like it's going to come into effect um if we break 3800 then i'm going to change my tune i mean that would be a pretty massive sharp drawdown for today uh, but you know, really, the level we're watching, just to give a little more context, is this 3,800 because it's under here where there where net put positions really increase and where dealers are likely to really start shorting pretty heavy. Um, but the call wall, you know, a lot of the levels aren't in play today simply because they're so far away from you know where ES is trading, and so you know anything really above 3,900 obviously is pretty much irrelevant for today. But our model still sees support and resistance if we were to get there. Um, so. On any given day, you know, different levels matter, matter more. Um, you know, today it just happens to really be the 3850 area and, you know, then these two big zones at 3900 and 3800. So I, ho I hope that answers your question, uh, Kendall. Yeah, so Steve, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we've answered your question. Steve asked, he's a day trader and how could spot gamma levels help? Um, it's volatility and then support and resistance. Are Those are kind of the two key things that... that you know we're offering um and we think that could be you know fit in with really anyone's strategy so um good question about when these are updated so we so the big open interest update is made available at midnight roughly so we update our levels at 3 a.m uh and that's the only time they're updated um we 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 give open interest or update our open interest at the first available opportunity which is around midnight um and so intraday volumes 
are not included in our levels. And the reason is because we don't know whether people are buying or selling options, right? We just know that there's volume. Um, and so it's really key to, to note that, um, that the levels don't change intraday, they update overnight, but these levels tend to get so big that regardless of what happens on an intraday basis, it generally won't shift things all that much. Um, okay, and then Alan asks about individual uh, stocks. So let's let's shift and transition over to that. And I loaded up a couple names here to look at uh, to explain how this stuff works in single stocks. So um, Tesla is obviously you know one of the big names here that everyone is watching, uh, and is a big deal um, to the Nasdaq and the S and P because it is such a large weighting in those uh, in those indices. So we do offer all the same levels and eventually we'll have cloud notes for single stocks. It's something we're working on. It's a, it's a very big data intensive project. Um, but the supporting resistance lines that we talked about before with the S and P it's the same concept with single stocks. And it's also the same concept with volatility. And so what's interesting about Tesla is that if you look at open interest from Tesla over the last several days, which you can do in this equity hub tool, We'll show you where the big open interest is concentrated and what it is exactly that led to sort of the pin being pulled in Tesla and Tesla stock. And we've done a lot of videos about this. If you're interested in Tesla in particular, you can uh, go to our YouTube channel and check that out or our site. We have uh, charts posted about this. But the biggest open interest strike in or in gamma terms in Tesla right now is, is 700. Going into last week, and I'll explain sort of the whole chart, the chart as a whole. But going into last week, it was 800. And so I mentioned that there was a very big expiration that took place on the 19th and that reduced gamma in a major way. So if you look at on Friday, going into Friday's expiration, 40% of total gamma in Tesla expired. And it was at the 800 level that most of that position was concentrated. So what we what we like to say is that was that 800 area was a pin, right? The, the hedging flows, were tied to the 800 strike, which kept bringing the stock back to 800. And then that pin was pulled essentially on Friday expiration. And so that allows levels to shift and the stock to really shift around. And the stock is down something like 12%, you know, this week. Um, and so if you look at how the thing is trading, you know, this is a stock that is no longer pinned, um, obviously. You know, these are these are huge volatile moves and, and changes in range is because it's lost that big open interest area. Over 800 was where all the calls were positioned and, you know, where things were kind of a bullish uh, skew to options were positioned. And then once that 800 level, was, that pin was pulled, then the thing is just open to move and really shift around quite rapidly, right? Dealer hedging flows are no longer going to help sort of suppress volatility in the name. Now, what's also interesting is we mentioned 700 is the big strike, right? And so... If you're a single stock trader and you know that there's still, you know, there's still a big options position, right? It's not as big as it was. And we can tell that based on, you know, this, I don't want to get into sort of the nuts and bolts of this here, but we know it's still a big options position because 25% of the total game expires this Friday, the 26th, and that's all tied to 700. So you have this magnet, right? The magnet zone, the path of sort of least resistance, as I like to look at it, is back into the 700 strike in Tesla. And so, you know, it makes sense that you would get sort of these pretty wild moves that just draw back up into that big open interest zone of 700. And that's sort of the level that's going to be in play, uh, at least based on today's setup into Friday. And so, again, it's the same thing, right? What's support and resistance? Well, resistance is here now at 700. If you were long the stock being long over 700, we could argue that doesn't make much sense now because 700 is the pin level, right? That's where all the options open interest is forming. And we can do this on different stock. Over the summer when Tesla was, you know, everyone was buying calls, you could you could detect the Friday pin level with a lot of uh, with a lot of accuracy because you could see where all that open interest was forming, right? And as we're watching the stock right here, you know, you can see 67,000 are on the on the ask, uh, and that's you know just a giant level for the stock here. This big you know orange bar here that that book map is showing you. Um, and so you can, again, you can see just as with the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, you know, it's the same single, it's the same concept, right? It's the same idea with single stock. 
these big open interest areas are big hedging areas. They're big zones of liquidity and, you know, stocks and futures go to where the liquidity is. Um, and so you can, you can see that stuff uh, play out in single stocks. GameStop was another one, you know, for how much activity was in this stock, right? For all of the different players, Wall Street bets and, and uh, hedge fund short covering and all the like, you could, you know, we predicted and you could see it on our site where the stock was going to go based on big open interest levels. So, you know, if we look at GameStop and, you know, and if, and if you can predict sort of where the big levels are in GameStop and, and, and Tesla, right, which, which have so many different kinds of flows occurring, um, you can look at it and figure out, you know, imagine what it can do on some of these um, names that are, you know, have even larger options positions. So in GameStop, for example, 45 is resistance, right? I don't want to get into what these are. You just need to know their support and resistance lines. We have tons of training videos, you know, that y'all can dig into on that. But 40 is support, 45 is resistance. 25% of this position expires on Friday. So it's not a huge position, but it's still pretty large. And if you should look at this history tool, you can see how this support and resistance line shift. Into last week, it was around 50. And then all of a sudden, the, sh the major hedging levels drop down, right, to 40. And now we're at 45, 40 based off what the what the open interest uh, is telling us today. So look at where the stock is. It's bouncing at 40 and resistance is at 45. And you can see that that pinged here. And these levels shift every day and the way that the stock moves every day. So this isn't sort of like a cherry picking situation where, our, you know, uh, you know, we're just sort of uh, showing which stocks met the support and resistance. You can find stocks with large open interest and large options activity respect these levels the same way that the S&P does. So, um, you know, if you're a swing trader in, in GameStop, well, buying at 40 and selling at 45 makes a lot of sense, right? If you're a swing trader and looking at Tesla, selling at 700 makes a lot of sense. If you want to short Tesla, maybe shorting at 700 makes a lot of sense because you know you have that open interest uh, hedging activity to, to lean on. Uh, Palantir is one that I watch a lot because it has such a large open interest um, complex and i believe i'm not sure and i haven't looked at where the options uh open interest levels are here but let's take a quick look uh so 30 is where all of that big options positions are located um now one of the things we want to note which is interesting is the color scheme here right deep dark red means it's mostly puts a name has mostly put positions on uh, around where the stock is trading and so you know this can again dictate how the flows may move a little bit but you can see all of our levels are concentrated at 30 and there is one support level or one level of note which is 25 this is where most of the put open interest is so palantir you know traded down to the 25 level right now and actually broke that this morning you can see the liquidity here at 25 and you know if you sort of are interested in a long swing, well, we would say that there's pretty good flows that could push this thing back up into the 30 area, right? Because at that 30 strike is where so much options open interest is concentrated. So again, there's the thing that you have also have to be aware of with single stock, obviously, is there's other dynamics at play, right? I know Palantir just had, uh, uh, I believe they're in, they're, uh, the window opened for insiders to start selling or not insiders, uh, corporate sales. Um, I know I'm missing the terminology, but hopefully you'll get what I'm saying, right? You can have you can have earnings uh, or open interest, you know, some other flows that can come into these uh, that can come into these levels and names, uh, just like news sort of breaking in the ES, right? So um, those are obviously different things to always always consider. Uh, so with that, uh, I think we'll we'll take some questions and see um, what other questions people have. Someone is asking about Apple. So here's our current setup in Apple. Uh, 135 is the big strike in Apple. It's just really kind of where all the flows seem to link. I'm not sure. I think the stock is quite a bit below that. Uh, if I'm right, Let's see if uh, I can add Apple in here without things breaking on me. So what's interesting too about Apple is that you know there's not net call positions, and and we're seeing this in a lot of stocks, right? That over the summer, these charts would be all green, and now they've really shifted red. And that's that's telling you that investors are changing, right? From a from a psychological perspective, you know, all these names being in a red zone, so to speak, in a put zone, is is information that that I think is is pretty useful to investors. Um, while all of a sudden, you know, tech is weak, and all these names have 
you know, very solid uh, put positions is, is is something that's that's really quite interesting. And so, if you're going to get a bounce higher, it would be sort of akin to short covering, right? As opposed to sort of like a a very bullish sort of you know move higher in the stock is, is sort of how we would look at that. Um, is there a way to tell what strike a stock we pin to each Friday? Yeah. So um, the way to look at pins is one: are all the positions concentrated? Are all of our metrics concentrated at in, you know at certain strike? And then how much gamma is going to expire on this Friday's expiration, which is what this net expiration is telling you. So like last week, 50% of total stock gamma expired, uh, which is a very big amount. But if you see this number being, you know, 30 or 40 plus percent and all the and all the strikes are concentrated uh, at a certain level, then you know that that could be a big play. Right. So AG is one that I like to watch a lot. These are very you know, there's a very concentrated position at 50, or excuse me, at 20. And as of right now, 30% of this is expiring on Friday, right? So depending on how the stock is trading, you know that 30% of that position, at least as of this moment, is going away this Friday. And those flows can affect how the stock is going to move the next day, right? If this is mostly put positions, which I suggest, obviously, because this is big and red, well, maybe that pin being removed means short covering in the name, um, you know, can can lead to a rally, right? So you have to add a little bit of extra analysis in here when trying to determine which way a pin, you know, the pin being pulled can affect the name, but just asking, is a name gonna pin? Well, if we see all the, all these areas, uh, strikes concentrated at a certain strike, or excuse me, levels concentrated at a certain strike, and you see 30, 40% plus of the name's total options position or, you know, measured on a gamma basis is going away, then that can tell you that there's a pin uh, you know, into this nearest Friday's expiration. And we do offer a scanning tool where you can go in and find out which names are, are most likely to uh, to pin. Um, Alan also asks, you know, is it the highest open interest? It's not the highest open interest. It's generally where the most gamma is positioned. Gamma is telling you where the, the highest hedging flows are tied to. Um, and so, you know, you want to look at where gamma is positioned, not just open interest. Um, hey, Mark, my buddy Mark. Uh, so the model assumptions for equities are a little bit different. We assume that um, in equities, dealers are short both puts and calls, and so that would put them in a, in a negative gamma position regardless of how the stock is trading, whereas in, in the indexes, we assume that dealers are long calls and short puts, and that's what allows things to split between positive and negative gamma. That, that's something that uh, we have some videos on and we can talk about sort of uh, maybe uh, in our next webinar, which should be a little more advanced. Uh, Alan, lockup period. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. In, in Palantir expired. Um, Mara, people want to check out Mara, M-A-R-A. Uh, so Mara is one of these kind of bit, Bitcoin names. The 40 strike is where, you know, that seems to be very concentrated. Obviously, this thing, you know, this is a great you know, uh, mention of a pin. I don't know where this is trading because it ties so close to Bitcoin. I'll bring it up in a minute, but you know, 40 is just a huge strike in this level. Interesting that it's slightly red here, which is telling you that there's a pretty decent amount of put open interest there. Uh, and 45% of this ex position as of today expires on Friday, right? 226. So, you know, I would look for major options related shifts on Friday night into uh, Monday based on this. So let's check out Mar and Bookmap. And we will eventually get our equity levels uh, loaded up. So it looks like the stock, and you can see I'm having some system problems here, but it looks like the stock is all the way down at 30 right now. So that big 40 level is not in play at the moment. Um, if I was going to look for a rally in the stock, uh, I would be checking call volumes today to see you know what's going on there but anytime you have bitcoin down 10 15 20 000 or whatever it is today uh the stock is going to get pretty beat up uh that's funny um Rijin roku sorry i'm trying to find some of these other questions um with the weight of tesla and the s p 500 are we finding indication if tesla is guiding the s p uh good question kendall um that is obviously going to have a big weight on the S&P when that goes down. I mean, the S&P is much more tech heavy now than it used to be, obviously, with that big Tesla weighting. And so, you know, when you see that um, 
So, so there's overlap, right, obviously, between names that are in the S&P 500 and names that are in the NASDAQ. So if we have weak stocks like Tesla and then the NASDAQ is weak, those are also going to be kind of dragging down, right? Dealers have to hedge NASDAQ, you know, arguably shorting more futures this morning than they would S&P. So those things are all kind of correlated or linked, right? One of the things about volatility is when, you know, uh, it's correlation, right? There, there tends to be high correlation. In other words, when things sell off, everything sells off together, right? Everything is very correlated in those sell-offs um, because people just start dumping everything. Um, and so I, I didn't check any kind of measures of correlation this morning, but you know, if we have weakness in that big tech names, the NASDAQ is going to be a little weaker because of that. And that's also going to, you know, in turn drag down uh, S&P just, just because those things are all, all linked together. Um, I think I may have gotten everyone's questions and I know we're kind of coming up on the hour minute here. I'll just make sure we didn't miss anything as well. Um, yeah, Greg, so we have a ton of, so we have a four part uh, series on our, on our YouTube channel and our website. If you click on the fact that takes you from the basics of stocks and options and walks you all the way through into sort of what we call like our advanced gamma modeling. It's four videos. We also have tons of different uh, trading examples. Um, using bookmap here and, and sort of how the levels reacted to bookmap that's on our on our uh, YouTube channel so you can you can check those out um, and see how they uh, how other people use it um, and, and some good examples there um, features are not modeled there so I'm just trying to look through the questions here and see if I missed anything that was pertinent Yeah, so Alan asked one more question here. I'll take this one and then uh, maybe we'll sign off for the day. So can we use gamma tools to gauge implied volatility, meaning can we tell if the Vega component is too high or too low? So let's talk about that uh, kind of briefly. One of the things that we do every day in our notes is we produce what's called an implied move on the day. Um, and so if you were to look at our daily note for today i'll give everyone an example here of what that looks like uh and you get to look at our wordpress dashboard as well apologies <laughs> um so this is our report for this morning um you know we noted the key levels we talked about kind of the weighting of what we thought would happen but we produced this number called the one day implied move so what we do is we we look at how much gamma is trading on the day and from that from our historical record we can tell how much of a move in the s p is implied right because of the total gamma so basically we know that this is the gamma level of today and that typically equals a move a one day trading range of 1.1 percent or 44 points so our iv right our implied move for today is 44 points and that's the that's sort of where we expect the market to close within 44 points of the cash open. So based on that, you could theoretically trade options, right? And that's something that some more advanced option traders are doing. But if you were kind of looking for how much the market may move, right, uh, as a swing trader, you know, we would play bigger trading ranges. Last week, we saw implied moves closer to 28 points, right? So so that number actually can change quite a, quite a bit. When we had very large swings over the summer, you know, we were looking at implied moves of even upwards of 1.5 to 2%, you know, expectation. Um, so you can use this to sort of forecast volatility, but outside of the scope of our conversation here, but just know that we do produce this implied move, which is, which is giving everyone an idea of how much of a range we think things are going to move. Um, and you can use that to sort of figure out how large of a swing you want to take today or, or um, you know, what your, uh, what the possible outcomes are. Uh, for your very various trading trading measures. So, uh, great. So with that, uh, Bruce, I think we'll we'll probably sign off. We'll try to keep it an hour. I know it's a very volatile day, and people have a lot of trading to do. Um, so I uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Anyone that has any questions, please email us uh, at info at spotgamma.com. We're also at spotgamma on Twitter. Um, and if you want to try out our service, uh, please head over to the Bookmap Marketplace. And you can try out either the levels or the pro subscription, which gives you uh, two times daily notes, access to the equity hub and, and, and the website as well. Uh, yeah. Um, so a, a few a few notes. Um, sure. uh, so the, uh, the I put the, put the links in there. 
uh, into the chat uh, several times over. So if you guys have questions, you can reach out directly. Uh, there's um, links to the um, uh, new service that they have in the Bookmap Marketplace, uh, as well as uh, their website link and um, you know, et cetera, email and and whatnot. Um, so another note that uh, Brent will be back on Friday. Okay, so uh, he's um, uh, basically going through kind of uh, some of the basics here uh, and um, uh, you know applying. Uh, this to the chart and understanding uh, really how to, how to put these things together. Uh, and then uh, he's going to go into more depth uh, on, on Friday. So looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, so come back on Friday. Uh, so uh, uh, you can uh, learn even more in depth uh, the edge uh, that they're offering here. Some, some very unique stuff, guys. Uh, and um, there are many uh, bookmap traders in our webinars that are already using it. Uh, and um, uh, they, they swear by it. So uh, some, some really um, pre pretty amazing, insightful uh, levels here um, and just excellent work, uh, Brent, really. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, I appreciate it. And, um, you know, again, loading the levels into into book map like this every day just makes my life so much easier, I know. And uh, and we'll get the iceberg tracker up for Friday so that we can show how some of that, those uh the levels seem to interact with your with your new liquidity tools. I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, sounds good. So uh, yeah, thanks, Brent. And um, we'll have this recording up, guys, uh, in about uh, a couple hours or so. Uh, look for it there. I put the link into the chat as well. There was questions about it, so you'll have that. Uh, and uh, we'll we'll see you on Friday, Brent. Sweet, sounds good. Appreciate it, Bruce. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.